an essential part of concentration practice is setting a firm intention. In fact, that's the Thai translation for the Pali word samadhi, dang jai man, which means your intent is firm. In this case, you make up your mind, you're going to stay with the breath. Each breath coming in, each breath going out. And you do your best to stick with it, no matter what else comes up. You aid that intention by making the breath comfortable, makes it a more pleasant place to stay. And you can make it your game, shooting down any other thoughts that would come in the way. When you get really sensitive to the breath energy in the body, you'll notice that how a thought forms. The more quiet your mind, the more alert you are, the quicker you will be to see these things. There will be a stirring in the breath energy. It's hard to say whether it's physical or mental. It could be either. And at some point you make up your mind that it's a thought, it's mental. And it's a thought about X, it's a thought about tomorrow, thought about yesterday, thought about this person, that person. And something in the thought captures your imagination, captures your attention, and you build a whole world around it. And you go into that world. And at that point you're separated from the world of the body. But if you can see it as simply a stirring and then breathe right through it, that can be your game, zapping the thoughts. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. This mole appears here and you whack it. Another one appears over there, you whack it. This stirring in the body appears, and you breathe right through it. Then another one, another part of the body, you breathe right through it. But if that gets too distracting, just stay with the sensation of the breathing as best you can. And you'll learn a very important lesson, the power of intention. This is something that's going to be important all the way through the practice. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha, when he would describe the steps of understanding leading up to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, started with generosity, the intention to give. In this case, he tries to protect it as the free intention, freely chosen, voluntary intention to give. For many of us, that's our first real sense that we have freedom of choice. We have something we like, we could use it or could consume it, but something in us, inside us says, no, give it to somebody else. And we choose to go with that something inside us. We realize we're not slave to our appetites. So the act of giving makes you more sensitive to the fact of intention. The same with observing the precepts. You can't break a precept unintentionally. You take the precept to kill, but you happen to step on some ants without meaning to. That doesn't break the precept. So as you're protecting your precepts, you have to be very careful about what is your intention. And you begin to realize how muddy, how obscure many of your intentions are. So this is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, so you can be clear about our intentions and see them in the beginning stages to see exactly how they form, why they form. And you begin to realize that sometimes the mind will have one intention, but then it's kind of embarrassed about it, so it tries to cover it up with another intention. which is why our intentions are muddy. So we're trying to clean them out. But you're also beginning to realize that if you don't intentionally harm other beings, it has a good impact on your mind. 
the Buddha says the, the natural response to looking at your own actions and seeing that they're harmless is a sense of joy, a sense of well-being. And it's not just a pleasant sight, sound, smell, taste, or tactile sensation. It's a really pleasant idea. that you can live in this world and be harmless. You can develop good intentions to all. It's one of the reasons why the Forest of Johns will often talk about how much your precepts depend on developing goodwill. Because if you have ill will for someone, it's going to be very easy to find an excuse to break a precept around that person, to harm that person, harm yourself in the, in the process. So you remind yourself, if you have goodwill toward yourself and towards others, it's a lot easier to observe the precepts. And so you begin to see the power of the, your intentions to shape your life. This becomes even clearer as you develop concentration. You maintain that original intention. And it's going to have an effect on your body, and it's going to have an effect on your mind. Simply the fact of staying focused on the body it can be done in a skillful way and can be done in an unskillful way. You stick with one intention, and if you don't handle it right, put too much pressure on different parts of the body, or engage in unskillful mental images of what happens as you breathe in, which parts of the body have to get tense, which parts of the body don't, are not involved. You can really make yourself very uncomfortable here in the present moment, but you can change things. You don't have to do it that way. You stick with your intention to be with the breath, and you figure out, well, how can I do this so that it's actually good for the body? feels good breathing in, feels good breathing out, feels good where I'm focused. You begin to see why the Buddha said that our intentions have such a huge impact in shaping our lives. Because that's the lesson you want to learn from the concentration, the power of your intentions to shape things. You may find yourself frustrated with your inability to make the world outside bend to your intentions. But there's a lot that you can do inside as you work on your moods, you work on your thoughts. You work on the way you relate to the energies in your body. If you adjust your intentions and stick with the good ones, you can make a big difference. Which is why the idea that the Buddha teaches us simply to accept things as they are, or to be equanimous about everything, is a real misrepresentation of his teachings. He's more concerned about the power of the mind. Manobu Bhangama Tama. All experiences have the mind as a foreigner. They're shaped by the mind. The mind is in charge. This is precisely where it's in charge, as in your intentions. So we're learning how to use that power for good. As for equanimity, that's one of the aspects of the practice. As the Buddha said, we're when you practice meditation, you're like a goldsmith. The goldsmith sometimes has to put the gold in the fire, sometimes he has to take it out and blow on it. Sometimes he simply looks at it to see what needs to be done. And in the same way, sometimes you have to put in a lot of effort. That's like putting the gold in the fire. Other times you have to simply blow on it, the gold, i.e cool the mind down with a sense of well-being that comes from concentration. And other times you just simply look at it, i.e., you develop equanimity. So equanimity has its time and place, but it's not all times and all places. You have to learn when to put the effort in and when to be more reflective, when to be more resting. But that's all part of getting this right balance here in the present moment. So when you stick with this intention to stay with the breath, you realize you've got to do some adjustments so that your understanding of the breath 
is something that holds you through the whole hour. Your understanding of what it is to stay focused will also hold through the whole hour. In other words, you don't put a lot of pressure on one point. In fact, the main focus of your awareness should be an area where you disperse any tension. Which may be very different from the way most of us focus, but it's an important skill to learn. Otherwise, you're going to screw up the energies in your body, and it becomes an unpleasant place to be. So adjust your ideas about the breath, adjust your ideas about the focus, adjust your ideas of what it means to establish a focus and what it means to stay with a focus. Those are two different skills. You learn this by committing yourself to stay here and then reflecting on what you're doing. It's through commitment and reflection you, that the Dharma grows, that the Dharma inside you is nourished. So you make the effort to stay, and then you reflect on how to do that skillfully. That's how the practice of concentration leads to discernment. That's the discernment that the mind gets freed.